today, so hopefully it'll be very informative for everybody. Thank you. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Wow, response. <laughs> uh, I know I, I, I is, is court dark today? There's folks in court? Oh, yeah. oh, okay. But most of you no court today? Well, of course there's a training, right? <laughs> you don't have enough to do. Phone calls to return. And, uh, so here we are. Um, I've been talking with Danielle and Ken for a couple of months about bringing you guys a training that's focused primarily on expert witnesses. So uh, that's what we did today. Hopefully um, you're going to get a lot out of this. We're going to be focusing on direct exam, cross exam, foundation, impeachment, and refreshing, uh, all in the context of expert witnesses. Now, I understand we're being videotaped. Um, so it's a training day. We're in LA, so I'm thinking like Denzel Washington, Ethan Hawke kind of training day. I might take you guys on a ride. Uh, there'll be probably less cursing, but not a lot less. Uh, like I tell my clients, I, I promise effort, not success. So uh, I'm gonna try not to curse so much on the, on the camera, but forgive me if, if I slip up. Um, so uh, I guess we'll start with introductions. My name's Kevin Lemieux. Uh, I'm an attorney in San Diego. I, my background is mostly in juvenile dependency. Um, I was a public defender when public defenders represented parents and kids in San Diego County. I represented parents exclusively. Uh, when that went private and we had a little law firm named DLG in San Diego for about six years, I was one of the supervising attorneys uh, for the primary parent office in San Diego. We do things a little different than you all. Question already? Oh, you're waving to her? Um, we do things a little differently the way we assign our parent cases and uh, my office always took the offending parent if such a parent could be identified at detention. So um, I did that for, uh, I don't know, 11 years or so. Um, and I've done a lot of training, so I've, I've trained at Ladle probably four times over the last number of years, so if, I don't know, I'm looking for familiar faces, I don't see many, but um, that's my deal. I'm in private practice now, I'll have to put out some cards. I still do a little bit of dependency, I do adult criminal defense, and I sue the department. You'll notice maybe, uh, by the way, my normal vernacular is we call that the agency in San Diego, you all call that a department, ours sounds a little more Darth Vader-ish <laughs> in the department, but uh, in San Diego I sue the agency when kids get hurt in foster care, uh, they screw up on parents, things like that. So um, if you all have, here's my, my cheap pitch, if you all have those cases give me a call, I'd love to sue the department in LA too. <laughs> them on my hit list along with San Diego. Uh, we've had some cool cases. I just settled one actually very recently where the, uh, the agency forged my client's signature on a medical release document to get her medical records from County Mental Health. Um, and of course use that against her independence in court. Um, so those kind of cases, those are fun stuff. So uh, give me a call if something weird happens to your clients or their kids. Um, so that's, that's what I do now. I do a lot of teaching as well. I'm a, I'm a speaker and a presenter for the Juvenile Law Society and for NIDA, which is the um, National Institute for Trial Advocacy. I do a, an eight-day training here in L.A. every January, and I do one in San Diego, too. So uh, I do a lot of this. Um, that's me in a nutshell. Jim and I both like to talk. So if you guys got something to say, raise your hand. This is basically a day of mostly lecture, so that's boring. Um, so please, if you have questions, interrupt. We'd be thrilled to answer the questions and break the, you know, our pace a little bit. We're definitely cool with that. Um, and there's, you guys are going to notice, there's going to be some times where I ask for volunteers. Um, I assume that that. We may, some people may have to be voluntold. We may not have a whole lot of hands to come up and demonstrate some things. We're even going to have you do some things in your seats, and Jim and I are going to kind of walk around 
uh, that though this room is not all conducive to, not all that conducive to us walking around and listening in, but uh, we're going to try to make it not boring with the understanding that we're all stuck in a room for the whole day. So, good luck. And this is Jim McMahon. Jim? Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Um, I, am, I was riding up in the elevator with a couple of you this morning, and there was some conversation back and forth about uh, some, something vacillating between, I hope, or I hear these guys are legit. Um, <laughs> so, you know, you guys can answer that question at the end of the day. I also do a lot of trainings, and uh, my thing is, at the end of the day, hopefully you guys take a couple, well, we're going to cover a lot, but hopefully you take a couple things with you that, that you can use in your next couple of trials and, and incorporate it into your practice. So that's kind of the goal here. Um, I'm currently a supervising attorney with the alternate public defender's office in San Diego. Um, I have a dear spot in my heart for dependency because that's where I started. I did five years of dependency in the courtroom. Um, my wife did 12 years of dependency, so we're, we're dependency oriented. After five years of dependency, I did two years of writs and appeals in dependency. And then I did juvenile law for a little, juvenile delinquency for a little bit, and then I've been an adult criminal for the past uh, 12, 13 years. And even though I'm supervising, I still do at least three to four lifetime trials, jury trials a year. So I'm, I'm in the trenches as well with you guys. So um, that's kind of my background. Um, Again, we're, we're going to cover cross-examination and direct examination. Um, I know the focus or the, the billboard on this was on experts, but we're going to kind of start at the basics and go forward because you can't really talk about cross-examination of experts or direct examination without first talking about direct examination and cross-examination. We're going to probably teach you a few things or tell you a few things you are painfully obvious that you already know, but that's kind of the foundation of where we're going and then into the more kind of advanced techniques. So hopefully um, you can walk out of this with, with something you can use in your, your trials. And um, again, it's a pretty big group. It's pretty informal. Any questions, don't hesitate to, to raise your hands. So. All right, um, one of the materials that you guys got is an example of an expert direct exam. Don't take it out. Because I want to see some actual progress. You're going to get a chance to do an expert direct, uh, some of you anyway. Um, so let, let's, let's put that one at the bottom of your pile. Um, and just know that I, I created that specifically for dependency, so you guys could take that thing and Put it in your trial notebook and use it in real court. All the questions are legit. You'll get any expert. Uh, with, you know, it's a legit foundation. So um, that's a real tool that you'll be able to use in court. But let's not let's not go over it too much yet. We'll get there. Um, let's start with uh, how many ten-year lawyers in the room? Anybody? One. Uh, how about how about a five five year lawyers? Okay, a few. Is anybody in their first year of practice? All right, cool. Um, so, uh, you know, when Jim says we're going to do some of the basics first, um, that's true. So, if you guys are super experienced, bear with us through the the basics of direct and cross. But I, I can tell you from my own experience. Uh, you know, it, it never hurts to go over this stuff because it's, it's like baseball. You know, if you forget the fundamentals, uh, everything's going to go to shit. So uh, we're going to go over some fundamentals. And, and I don't know if you guys heard Jim Jim talked about his experience. Um, you know, it, it's really a wealth of experience. Jim does, like, death penalty trials, like, exclusively. So what he tells us about trials, you know, my experience is mostly bench trials. Um, but we're going to be talking to you about things that are persuasive for judges and juries. And no offense is Ken here. No offense. You may not do dependency your whole career. Right? <laughs> um, so, you know, if you hear us talking about, we got a seat over here, but uh, you, if you hear us talking about the jury, um, just go with it. And you have to understand as well that ju in this, we'll, this is surprising. Judges are actually human beings. And, and they may be persuaded just as a juror would be. Um, so just keep that in mind. And, and if you hear us talk about juries and, and Jim's experience with juries, just go with it. 
go with it. We're going to start with the boring stuff, though. Um, I got about 10, 15 minutes of what's basically an evidence lecture, just to give you guys a little bit of background. Um, but we're going to be talking today about expert witnesses. The, the things that you need to do pre-trial when you're selecting your expert is don't just pick your, pick your experts based on their resume. Okay, you want to select someone who has expertise in your field, obviously, but you need a communicator. You need somebody who can actually speak in normal layman's English, right, and explain to your judge your theory of the case. Um, when you're preparing your expert, you need to actually give them all of the evidence, right? <laughs> Don't expect them to come up and wing it. And you've got to educate the expert about your theory. Hey, this is my theory. And your expert may tell you right off the bat, uh-uh, that's, that's not possible, right? Um, I assume uh, a lot of the, the experts that you guys may be able to put on the stand are going to be medical doctors. Has anybody had a medical doctor on direct? Your witness. Okay, so a bunch of guys. You know, this is easier said than done, right? These are like the busiest people on the planet. And they're giving your public law firm a break on the price and you're calling them up to talk about, you know, your theory of the case. They get it, though. Don't be dissuaded from doing that. Talk to your expert as much as you can pre-trial. Okay, um, we're going to talk about perception versus opinion. This is the difference between lay witness testimony and expert testimony, right? <laughs> lay witness testimony is based on sensory perception, okay? That's any fact that they know from sight, smell, hearing, touch, all that jazz, right? That's what we call lay witnesses for, to tell us what they saw, what they heard. Um, expert testimony is different. It's formed via expertise. It's based on analysis of the facts, right? Those sensory perception facts that other people have added to our story. Okay, you're also going to hear me say that just to let you guys know. Trials are stories. All right, all a trial is, is you telling a story to either a judge or a jury and trying to convince them that your story is more likely or at least more entertaining than the other side's story, right? You want to get them to believe your story. So your trial is just a story. Um, experts can include secondhand facts. We're going to go over that in another slide earlier, but I just want to point that out earlier. And they're allowed to evaluate all those facts, even the secondhand facts, using scientific process. So that's the advantage of having an expert versus a bunch of lay witnesses. You know, this is like an example of you, the kid goes to children's hospital and the nurse writes down facts. The temperature was this. The child <laughs> appeared this way. The pupils were, you know, but the doctor <clears throat> takes all of that and makes an opinion out of it. That's the difference between lay witness, sensory perception facts, and expert opinion analysis. Okay, so just real briefly on experts, this is the, the boring evidence part, the Fry-Kelly test, you know, Fry versus U.S., this is 1923, we're going way back, People versus Kelly, 1976. This is the old standard, um, is the scientific theory, uh, technique, or methodology generally accepted in the relevant scientific community? For a long time, that was a standard for expert testimony in court. Um, and then, you know, not that long ago, uh, really, you're talking like when DNA started coming around, the court started thinking, well, maybe there's some stuff that's not generally accepted yet, but it's legit science. Uh, so they had to change that. And then the federal courts were the leader on this. They had federal court rule 702 and the daughter case in 93. It said Fry no longer governs, so it's that, that generally accepted in the scientific community is not the be-all, end-all, it became a factor in a greater analysis that the court's allowed to do. And 702 in the federal rules says the judge is the gatekeeper of any new offering. So if you have a novel scientific process, such as in 93 DNA, something like that, the judge can, can consider more than just if it's generally accepted in the scientific community, recognizing that you've got to start somewhere with anything that's new, right? Um, if the theory or process is novel, you have what's known as a Daubert hearing. That's federal court. California didn't adopt Daubert, um, but 720 
onwards in the California Evidence Code is based on Dauber. Okay. Um, and 801 and 803 allow the trial courts to evaluate the factual basis and be a gatekeeper just like federal judges. Okay. So California is the same rule. It's just different numbers. Oh, novel processes are subject to greater scrutiny. Okay, but the judge can still say this is legit science. I'm going to let them talk about it. Um, an example is, uh, has anybody ever come across in dependency for the treatment of trauma, um, eye movement desensitization therapy? Eye, rap, eye movement therapy, has anybody come across this yet? So there's a type of therapy, it's, it's new, where um, while, while the, uh, the, the patient is in therapy, there's stimuli to the left side of the brain and the right side of the brain via visual cues or things they hold in their hand. That and, and it's the science behind it is is somehow that trauma sits in your brain when the right side and the left side of the brain aren't communicating properly. And if the the emotional side and the reasonable side of your brain are able to communicate, you can sort of dissolve the trauma. EMDR. Oh, EMDR. That's mm -hmm. the stuff. Eye movement desensitization something. Uh, that's an example. It's new. You know, if you have a client who's a trauma victim, let's say it's a domestic violence case, and you have mom who's been a victim forever, uh, and she goes to EMDR therapy, you may have to have a hearing to convince your judge that this is legit science. Okay, but that stuff's pretty rare. Uh, in California, Evidence Code 720, person's qualified to testify as an expert if he or she has special knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education sufficient to qualify him as an expert. Um, please notice the or. We tend to get hung up on education, but you only need one of those things to be considered an expert in any kind of topic. All right? Experience is a big one. Okay? So don't get, don't get stuck just on education. Um, against an objection, your expert must demonstrate this in order to testify. Okay? That's voir dire. 801 and 803 in California are the evidence code sections that allow the court to act as a gatekeeper. So the first thing, 801, the judge must decide if the subject matter is beyond the common experience and would this testimony assist the trier of fact in some way. That's a pretty easy standard burden to get over. The second is, is the basis of the opinion <coughs> a proper basis. If it's not, your judge can ex exclude the testimony. This is the gatekeeper statute. Same as the federal rules. Um, they can base their opinions on a wide variety of information. Like I stated before, they can use secondhand facts in California, right? Um, and by the way, I have a cold, so if I sound weird and you guys, if my voice cuts out, I apologize. I'm going to drink a lot of coffee and I got cough drops, so hopefully I get through it. Um, so the expert can testify about what she heard. Um, she can state the reasons for her opinion in the matter upon which it's based. Okay? Um, but this all often comes to bite us. Um, from social workers. Right now in LA, and, and different courts do this differently, in LA are your social workers considered expert witnesses when they testify? Anybody? Yes? No? Sometimes. They give their opinion, right? Do they testify about risk? Yeah. So county council skipping the formal steps. <coughs> They probably just put their, did they put their CV into evidence before they testify ever? They, they do down south. Um, but I guarantee you, your social workers are giving their opinion on things. Um, you can challenge it. You can challenge your expertise, absolutely. If we go back against an objection, that expert must demonstrate one of these. Special knowledge, skill, experience, training, or education. Um, and you can go after somebody, if nothing else, let's say you have a brand new social worker, their first case, right? Right out of social worker boot camp. 
<laughs> um, yeah, you can go after them. They're probably going to qualify to give their opinion based on their training and their education. But at least you're making a point about weight to the judge. Right? And you can make that point in your closing argument. Weight matters. Red flags, too. If you've got a social worker who's all of a sudden been a social worker for a year or two and she's talking about bite mark science or she's talking about traumatic brain injury, that's, that's a stop right there. Let's take this social worker and let's start cross-examining her to see if that opinion, she has a basis in the training and the experience to give that opinion. Because I had trials early on. All of a sudden, the social worker who's been around for about a year is talking about traumatic brain injury. I'm like, whoa, 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 wait. And I had was successful a couple of times. Our judges are pretty liberal and, and liberal for the agency in San Diego. But a couple of times, the judge said, no, I don't see the, the foundation for this kind of expert testimony. So when your social worker starts talking about something other than visitation and, and observations and things like that, they're moving into the, the expertise area. And you might be able to, to challenge it. It's yeah. something to think about. Absolutely. Don't let them go down those roads. Um, what I also wanted to point out, if the social worker is testifying as an expert, okay, and I think in your trials you can differentiate. Hey, we're in the sensory perception lay witness part of the testimony and we're in the expert part of the testimony, right? Um, this is where they sneak in all the, the hearsay and things like that when they testify. It has to be a basis of an expert opinion. So. In California, we have a hearsay exception for social worker reports, not live testimony. So don't let the social worker get out of stand and start testifying about hearsay. There is no exception for that in, a, in the WIC. Yes, ma'am. So a lot of times when I have a social worker on the stand and I'm asking them about, okay, well, what, what is your opinion? What is your opinion and what's based on it? We'll often say, it's the department's opinion that this. Is that kind of a yeah. way around that? Or would you still think that that's... Well, maybe you can call them to the carpet and say, oh, I'm sorry, you're not the expert? And perhaps, is there someone else at the department I should be talking to? Because we're looking for the, the expert opinion. Um, so maybe you can kind of call them out a little bit. But yeah, I mean, that's the politically correct, bogus answer. Um, but remember, if they're going to start talking about things that are not otherwise admissible, it can only come in as a basis of their expert opinion. So if they're telling you set up stuff about factually what happened, that stuff shouldn't come in. Okay? Um, federal treatment, you all don't care. That's it. Um, for the, the straight up evidence lecture part. Okay, so as promised, 15 minutes of boredom. Question? Actually, it's a comment. I think many of you are now seeing in our drug cases, you'll see it over and over and over again in the jurist report, where the department now, because of this Alexander C. case, you're going to see a statement about methamphetamine and how drugs now, I don't know, you guys are nodding your head. You know, everyone's seeing it now over and over again in the jurist report. Because they're trying to meet in the Juris Report the DSM's um, definition of substance abuse disorder. When you've got the worker on the stand, you've just given us a great thing. We now can cross-examine the worker and that statement to distinguish that that worker is not a substance abuse expert. And we can try that for a motion in limine, get those statements in the Juris Report thrown out, and go, this is a great, great idea how to go after the social workers on drug cases. Because they're, they're repeating that in order to get around, not get around, they're bolstering Alexander C. So go after the social worker on that. That's a wonderful idea that you've just given us. All right. Jim's turn. Okay, just so I, I know my audience this morning, are we all parents' attorneys? Yes. yes. Any children's or minors' attorneys? Well, okay. yeah, because we represent a couple sometimes of minors. Sometimes minors, but mostly parents' attorneys. Okay. Um, yeah. Oh, other question. Are you all in front of the, assigned to a courtroom and have the same judge over and over? Okay, so there's, there's not a lot of forum shopping. Same, same judge hearing the same arguments. Okay, um, that's tough. Um, juries, judges, 
they're different <coughs> entities, but we, we, you know, there's, you kind of got to mix, it's actually easier with juries in a lot of ways. You kind of got to mix up your game so the judge doesn't hear your same arguments over and over. Mm -hmm. So hopefully we'll give you some ideas there. When I first started, I was in front of a judge who basically had a big giant rubber stamp on his, on his desk, and anything that came across his desk in the social worker's report was just done. It, it was over. And, I, and our minors attorneys then uh, submitted on the recommendations of the social worker over and over. I mean, little or no independent effort. And uh, talking about what happened in our county years ago, don't want to disparage anyone. But um, although you're all parents' attorneys, so I see a lot of nodding heads. Um, but it's tough. I, first couple of years, I had this judge, just everything. You know, we're dealing with preponderance of the evidence to begin with. The evidence code doesn't really apply to a certain extent. And uh, what, losing and losing and losing. And, you know, I'd be just starting out. And I said, what's wrong with me? You know, I started developing this thing where I need to surrender my bar card so I don't hurt anyone else. Um, <laughs> and then I switched judges. And uh, I started winning. I started winning cases. And um, then I started thinking I was God's gift to dependency. Uh, <laughs> then I got another judge that was more losing and winning. And so, you know, like most things, the truth somewhere in the middle. But uh, it's tough when you have the same, the same judge. So I'll, I'll be talking a little bit about juries, but um, mostly, you know, it, it is tougher with judges, and you do kind of have to take novel approaches. So um, just an FYI for the rest of the lecture about your, your uh, judicial audience or, or how that works. Okay, uh, direct examination. Um, you know, a lot of our trials uh, are based on cross-examination. Um, that's where defense attorneys um, done a lot of trials where the, the crux of my case is cross-examination, what the social worker didn't do, who they didn't call, who they didn't report to, what they forgot to put in their reports. Um, and that's a different kind of trial. Uh, but when you're going to direct examination as, de as dependency defense attorneys, um, you're putting on your own case. You're developing your own themes. And, you know, what's the whole point of this? Especially if you, you're putting on your own experts. I'm putting on my case with my theories, and it's more credible and believable than what the agency is, is putting on. So, you know, it's the single most important part of your trial if you're going that way and putting on um, uh, witnesses. Uh, you build your case on direct examination because that's, that's your theme. And again, this is for cases where um, you're putting on witnesses. Um, uh, cases are one as a consequence is direct. We want to develop our themes. You know, when we're doing these, these trials in front of these judges, um, we've got to let them know where we're going and why we're going that direct direction. So theme-oriented. Everything you do is based on what your theme is on that, in that trial. Um, uh, refer to your proof and your chart in closing. Um, it's your roadmap. So pick your theme, go with it, and you develop your direct examination um, around that. My doctor's more experienced than their doctor, whatever the case may be. Their doctor didn't do A, B, and C. That's why he's not credible. So those are, can be your themes. Um, okay, starting with lay witnesses. Uh, lay witnesses, they are locked into, pretty much by the rules of evidence, see, hear, feel, smudge, smell, touch, do, and say. Um, that's what they're here to say. What they saw, the light was green. I saw the car go through the signal when it was red. Um, I, I, whatever the case may be, I know the mother. The mother uh, would visit the child on January every week for four hours. I saw the mother interact with the child. Those are all observations based on sensory perception. Going too far, well, the mother is a great mother. Well, that's a conclusion. That may be true, but your lay witness isn't going to be able to, to do that. The mother loves the child. Well, you can't really testify to that as a, as a lay witness. You can testify to the mother caressed the child. The mother would kiss the child. When the child fell down, I observed the mother going over to, to um, embrace the child. Th those are sensory perceptions. And, you know, in our trials, um, we want to humanize our, our clients. We want our, our parents to, to, to be human. You know, the social workers just, oh man, 
you know, they just get, get thrashing in the, in the social, social work reports, in the, in the six months, 12 month, 18 month review reports, um, just a real thrashing. And you know, you've got a judge going through these reports, reading them in chambers, but if we're putting on our trials, we want to humanize them. We want to slow things down. We want our judge to think about this parent in this situation. And you're going to have to do that by using expressive language, giving examples, and, and you know, making the judge feel like he was there at the visit. He witnessed things. Whether you're doing a 2-6 hearing or a six-month review, you're talking about visits, or, or even a jurisdictional trial, or dispositional as well. But you want the judge to, to slow down and feel for your client. You've got to humanize it. You've got to humanize it. You know, this report that, that, that goes into the, you know, in, that gets submitted to the court, um, not a lot of humanization in that, in that report. In fact, that's the opposite. You know, who is this beast who does these horrible things to, to the child? And you've got to slow it down and use descriptive words and make the judge feel like they were there at that visit, that they were, they were present. That, that they can see this mother going over and caressing the child, when he, you know, whatever the case may be. You draw it out from your own observations or, and what you have in the reports. But we want to, really want to humanize our clients. Um, more on this, uh, facts are not opinions or conclusions. And really, you, you need to, for lay witnesses, we're going to get to experts, but we need to make sure we stay in the rules of evidence. Because as soon as your witness, a lay person, makes those conclusionary statements. Oh, the mother's a very loving parent. That's a conclusion. That's a lay uh, witness um, <laughs> statement that, that is not allowed. Um, they're not testifying an expert. But you can get the same thing across, and even better. Conclusionary words aren't going to, sentences aren't going to get you very far. It's not going to humanize your client. But descriptions about what happened makes the judge feel like he's there, is present, is watching, and um, really kind of brings this thing. You want to give your, your judge word pictures, um, images in his mind, and his or her mind. And you get that through slowing things down. And again, I'm using the same example, but if it's a, a visit where someone observed um, something you want to, or you know, family interaction, you want to slow that down so the judge can put himself in that situation. That's, that's where you're going to make real-time impressions. We all love closing argument, you know, we get to wave our hands around and get all emotional, but if you're trying to win your case in closing argument, it's too late. You've got to make those real-time impressions. And that's how you do it, getting the testimony, drawing it out from your witnesses. We're going to talk a little bit about preparing witnesses in a minute as well. Example, conclusions, uh, Marie Williams hates Mr. Jackson and wants to get him back. That's based on these things here, that's probably very true, but it's a conclusion. And that's something you can say in your closing <coughs> argument, but you don't get to do it with a lay witness. So, what are observations? Our knowledge, Marie had an affair with Mr. Jackson. He told her he would leave his wife for her, but he never did. Ms. Mr. Jackson fired uh, Marie Williams. <laughs> Now, you can see, you've set this up, and you know why this is true. I can see why Marie hates um, Mr. Jackson and wants to get back at him. But that's for your closing argument. And if you go too far and ask for that opinion, you're going to get, if you've got a county council, um, they're going to object, and it's going to get sustained. Um, okay, so on direct examination, much, much different than cross-examination. Um, everything's different. Tony, your questions. <clears throat> your timing, your, your voice um, inflections, where you stand in the courtroom. Um, real simple, on direct examination, your witness is, is the star. In jury trials, we want the jury all looking at the witness, and we're standing back here. I will stand back right at the rail, and I will just let the witness go, because I want the attention. Same thing in, in bench trials. Um, we're, we're standing back. We are back here. I, I, you know, in cross-examination, I'm up front. I'm making my points. I'm moving around. I'm much more dr dramatic. I'm locking that witness in. Direct examination, stand back. Let your witness shine. Let him explain. Who stands up at all in trial? Raise your hand if you stand in trial. Okay. Huge mistake. All right? Because county counsel is lazy does not mean you should be lazy. 
All right. Advocates use their entire body when conducting direct and cross. Can't do that while you're sitting at council table. All right. Especially on cross. We'll get into that in a minute. On direct, maybe you get away with it because the focus is on the witness. But don't feel like because when you showed up in that courtroom as a brand new attorney and nobody else stood up. Do not assume that that is a rule. It is not a rule. Okay? You may stand up in your trials, and you should stand up in your trials. You should definitely stand up during cross, during opening if you do one, and definitely during closing. Okay? Culture is working against you. You should know that by now as parents' attorneys. The culture in dependency court is working against you. So you have to break that. It is not a rule. It's just culture. All right. So get up. Yeah, I agree. I mean, you're you're you, you know you, we need credibility. We need credibility in front of juries, but we also need it in front of the judges. Um, I was a stander when I when I gave opening statements, when I gave closing arguments. I mean, that doesn't mean that you know you do what you do in front of a jury. Sometimes you wave around and you move and you go into the well and you pound on the witness stand. You know, to get the, the jury kind of engaged so they're not falling asleep. Um, but I would very commonly, what I do in dependency court is I would stand, and I'd stand behind my, my, my desk, or excuse me, my chair, so I had a little bit of movement to move around and back. You know, not take it over the talk, top, but a little bit of movement and standing up, it projects your voice, and, you know, give you some confidence in the courtroom as well. So I, I completely agree. Try it. I, I, think, I think it would be helpful. Yes? Um, when you would stand, wouldn't that sometimes depend on who your witness is, though? Like, would you stand when you're cross-examining or direct-examining children, for instance? That's a good point. Every case is different. Every case is different. If you've got a, a child and, you know, in San Diego we did kids in court, so they were kind of acclimated to the, the court process. Even the defense attorneys would go meet them in the hallway. I'm not sure how it's done here. Um, you know, it, Every case is different and has an exception. Um, you may not want to. You may not want to. That may be a little intimidating to the child. Um, or maybe you want to stand, but you want to kind of stand back a little bit. And you want to maybe, you know, not have your hands waving, but just kind of hold it and give them space and some time. Um, you're going to have to judge that based on your witness. I don't think it's a mistake to do it, but if you've got a witness who's, who's just terrified and crying and you're standing up there going like that, <laughs> they're going to shut down. So. But, and I'll jump in on, on cross. I'll just give you an example about not being afraid to do this, and it may work to your advantage. I was stationed in a courtroom for a long time where the witness stand was on the same side of the courtroom as where county council sat at council table. Okay, so when I had a social worker on the stand, I'd walk my happy ass right behind the council. I'd stand right behind her. And I would cross examine and, and they're like, Lord. Because I wanna be I wanna be at that witness's level. I'm in control. This is cross examination, right? I got a social worker on the stand. I'm gonna stand here and I'm I'm gonna make eye contact. I'm on your level. I don't care that county council's sitting right here. It may intimidate county council even better. Um, but I'm in control of this witness, I'm in control of this testimony, and I'm going to stand right in front of my witness so that I have better control. If I'm way off where Jim is, and you're the witness, you know, I'm, I'm here, and I'm using my body language. I, I'm, this is my examination. Now, we're talking about direct, I just don't want to forget, since Jim brought up standing up and your location in the courtroom, it really matters, okay? Advocacy is not... Uh, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an analogy. It's not, you know, if it's basketball, it's not the play you get at timeout, right? It's the creativity. It's your ball skills. It's your, you know, it's everything. It's not just the nuts and bolts of which questions I'm going to ask, right? It's taking control in certain situations. You will change the way a social worker testifies if you're standing the way I'm looking at you for, if this is the way I do a cross-examination, okay? There's no question that I'm in control, all right? I don't sit back there and let you say whatever you want. When you start saying things I don't want you to say, hold on, I didn't ask you that, all right? I don't let that stuff go. This is part of being an advocate. And you better believe if you move out of the dependency world and you're doing jury trials and you have a 25-year cop on the stand 
It's going to get away from you quick, <laughs> right? Sorry. No, good point. Um, I do the same thing. I, I would. I don't think I've ever done a cross examination, dependency court, uh, criminal jury trials. Right in stand. It's your courtroom. Take over. It's not the judge's courtroom. It's not county counsel's courtroom. It's your courtroom. You have the bar card. You're representing this client. It's your courtroom. Use it. Use it effectively. And I would do the same thing. I'd go stand right behind county counsel because the witness stand was over here. And they'd be looking at me and bug the crap out of, me, out of them. And I loved it. It was fun. And so the only time I'd move away is if the witness, the social worker, kept looking at county counsel for their answers. And I'd kind of drift over here. Ma'am, I'm over here. If you could, you know, <laughs> they didn't like that either. But that's part of the, some of the little bit of intimidation. Yes. I would just say I've seen judges tell people to sit down when they did that, but because of the culture, but you can move your seat. Like if they tell you to sit down, you can move your seat right in front of the witness if you're told to sit down. Okay. Well, yeah, I mean, I'm just saying that's a. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and every. Um, during, just during the, you know. Sure. And. Um, I mean, I've never seen anybody being told to sit down on argument. And there's bad judges out there. Yeah, right? that's. And if you want to make a stink, ask them. I'm sorry, Your Honor, is that a rule? Is, is there a, am I missing something? If, you know, <laughs> if you know you're moving to another courtroom next week. <laughs> or if you're filling in for somebody, right? Go ahead and make a stink. I get it if you've got to be there every day. Um, so, you know, I mean, if you get stuck, you get stuck. But um, That's the exception that it's your courtroom. The judge tells you to sit down. No, no, it's, yeah. it's dependency court. All right. I well, try it. It, it. What's the worst thing they can tell you to do? Go back to your seat. All right, whatever. But try it. I'm just saying an alternative. Sure, absolutely. I, I mean, I've done it. Right. I'm just saying yeah. you might get told to sit down. Every, and if that's what you get told, you know, we, we, dependency is a small sandbox. You see that judge every single day and every single morning. Pick your battles carefully. He wants you to go stand some more. I'm else. just saying an alternative right. way to accomplish that sure. is to. I don't think I've seen anybody ever object to moving your seat so that you can have that eye contact with the witness. But I have seen an objection to the so well, like pacing a, and sure. pacing and standing. And well, there, there's an alternative. See what your judge will let you do. As I said, they're, they're not going to hold you in contempt. Give it a try. See what happens. And as long as you know, that's not a real objection. <laughs> yeah, I'm not saying that's don't do it. I'm just saying yeah. that they tell you there's an alternative. Yeah, there you go. You know, every courtroom's different, every judge is different. So we digress a little bit, but again, we're trying to talk about not only uh, expert witness and direct cross <coughs> with some trial skills as well. Um, okay, so you've got a lay witness. Um, it is very important, and I know dependency <coughs> cases. It, boy, I, I think at one point I had 280 cases, um, and another time I had 540. It was insane. I mean, my, my voicemail was full. We were in doing our review hearings in the morning and our detentions in the afternoon were two sixes and review, contested reviews. <laughs> um, so I, I get what, um, what you're up against. And, and I don't know what the case numbers are here, but I'm, I'm sure they're high because that's just the nature of dependency. But I encourage you, if you're going to put on a witness, Take time to have them come in and, and prepare them. Sit down. Let them know where you're going, why they're being called. Uh, they're going to be a better witness. You want to start developing a rapport with them ahead of time. And you know, you're probably not going to be able to accomplish that in five minutes out in the court, out in the um, hallway before the trial. So whenever possible, and I get the restraints of, of heavy caseloads, but um, <clears throat> try to prepare your witness, meet with them, explain what, what you're doing. Um, there is a fine line between coaching your witness and telling them uh, how, to, how to testify <clears throat> and not what to say. You know, I always start the same, tell my witnesses right off the bat, my, my disclaimer. I am not here to tell you what to testify to. If you don't remember anything I say, I just want you to get up there and tell the truth. And, you know, I've had cross-examinations where the county council got up and, and, and asked about conversations because this isn't attorney-client privilege, this is a witness. This is someone other than your client. So a lot of times, while well, Mr. McMahon told me to get up here and tell the truth. It's good stuff. Um, <laughs> so, um, but you can tell them what, what this looks like. Um, I want my witness to paint word pictures. I don't want them to say on direct, yes, 
or no? Again, looping back, I want them to make the judge feel that whatever I'm trying to convey, that they were there, what that looks like. And in order to do that, what you don't want to find yourself doing, this is what happens when you, your witnesses aren't fully prepared, is you're trying to draw it out on them and trying to get them to make, to make these you know, descriptive stories um, and, and, and get them to paint this, these word pictures. And that's part of telling, of walking through um, how to testify and what this looks like. You know, ma'am, I just want you to get up there and I want you to describe what you see. I want you to tell the judge, you know, what that was like. I want you to go back in your mind and, and when you, you were in the home making these observations and seeing that this mother with these loving um, actions towards her child, I want you to, to I want you to feel like the put the judge there in that situation. And that will take you a long way down the road rather than, well, I saw A and I saw B and I saw C. Okay, thank you. No, we, that's, if you're going to put a witness on, put them on. Let's, let's go the distance. So that's um, telling them uh, what to do, um, or excuse me, how to testify, not what to say. Appearance. There's not a witness I haven't, uh, haven't told to dress appropriately in court. Um, You'd be, well, you probably wouldn't be surprised. Um, I've had witnesses and uh, clients, too. I had a client in a trial, and the day I decided I was going to call him, he wore a white muscle t-shirt that said victorious across the front. <laughs> not good. Judge not impressed, jury not, impre not impressed. You know, baseball caps, I mean, shorts and flip-flops. I mean, you, you, you know what I'm saying. So don't forget to tell your, your, your witnesses how to how to uh, how to come to court and, and um, you know it's the judge's house you know you got to be respectful. Um, make sure they re so important. Make sure if you don't do anything else, make sure they review their statements they've given. They are going to need to know what they have said in the past because they are going to be crossing them one. You're going to be asking questions on it, and you want to make sure that they are consistent with what they have said in the past. <clears throat> and if they don't know <clears throat> or are not familiar with prior testimony, prior statements, prior interviews, they're going to look unprepared, <clears throat> and you're going to look unprepared. But the judge is going to know this, this witness wasn't, <clears throat> excuse me, this witness wasn't prepped. You know, you put a witness up, Mr. McMahon, he spent, it shows, you spent two minutes out in the hallway. <clears throat> excuse me. <clears throat> so this is another thing. If you have time, and I really stress it, um, <clears throat> practice with your witness. Walk them through you know, what this looks like, what the beginning of testimony is, the middle, and the end of testimony, so they know where you're going. It will put them at ease, and more importantly, um, the judge is going to notice that you have a rapport with this witness. This wants to be a conversation. You don't want this to be a tennis match. Yes, no, yes, no. That's for cross-examination. Um, but for direct examination, you want to have that rapport with your client. And that's how you get it. Spending some time with them. Um, <clears throat> let them know if you're going to use some kind of demonstrative evidence, any kind of exhibits, so they're not surprised when you walk up to them with, with something that you want them to describe. Um, <clears throat> again, preparation. Um, we've touched on this. Humanize your witnesses. Adds credibility. Um, don't tr treat your witnesses simply as a fact machine. You want the and I can't emphasize more. And I know I'm repeating myself because it's so important. You want your witnesses, and you want to draw them out and get them to make descriptions and make the, the judge feel like they are there. And that's that's getting away from the fact machine. Um, <clears throat> human emotions, when possible, you know, what what that was like. You know, describing that, drawing that out of them. Um, you're focusing on the person. This is a person who's taking the stand. So all things to, to think about when you're preparing your witness. Okay, the, the, the very big basics. Um, no leading questions on direct examination. Why? Well, you can't. The evidence code will says you can't, and you're going to get an objection. Um, and plus, it doesn't help you. Getting a yes or no answer out of your witness really doesn't, doesn't do much on direct examination, on direct. Cross-examination, different story, but you want them to draw them out and, and, and to really um, bring that testimony and those feelings and those observations in the, the courtroom. Yes? So in terms of humanizing the witness, you can go through their emotions as you go walking, you're walking them through the events. Is there anything that you can do preemptively to humanize them? I mean, you kind of touched upon clothing, 
Um, maybe they have some mannerisms or annoying. Is there anything that you do to humanize them even before you get to the events? Or um, well, there? you know, it's all, all part of witness prep. Um, you want to, you want them, you want to put them at ease. People don't like to get on the stand. They, they're nervous. Um, public speaking, people hate public speaking whether it's asking questions in front of a judge with a table of attorneys sitting there. So you want to try to put them at ease. Um, you want them to feel relaxed as much as you can in preparation. So you kind of walk them through. I think, to answer your question, just going over the testimony, getting them familiar with what you're asking and also what you're not going to ask, and also preparing them for cross-examination. What you do not want is to turn your witness into this, this, this you know, congenial um, witness who, who's answering your questions and as soon as it's crossed, you know, the face changes, the redness in the face, and it's game on <coughs> with the um, county council or the, or the children's attorney. So you want to prepare them for that, you know, that they want to, they want to, the judge is going to be looking at them. And what, what's the judge going to be looking at? Their credibility. Is this witness credible? So I think what goes a long way for credibility is preparing them for, um, not only direct, but for cross-examination as well. And, and you want them to, to answer the questions on cross-examination truthfully. You want them to you know, let them know, if there's something that comes up, I'll object. Or if there's something that, that I need to, to address, I'll come back on, on redirect examination. So you know, pre preparing them for the testimony, letting them know what, what they're there for, what issue they're here to talk about, I think sets them at ease. And, you know, that, that's part of humanizing the witness. Um, another part is, is, you know, getting them to tell these descriptive stories of what they observe. That, that will humanize a witness as well. Again, if your witness, it's kind of like on, when we're picking a jury. You know, can you be fair and impartial in, the, in this case, Mr. Smith? Yes. I haven't learned anything. That, that tells me nothing. Next question, why? Why can you be fair? Now I'm getting some, some, some feedback and I'm learning something. Same thing with direct examination. So to answer your question, walking through the process, having them dress appropriately, knowing what to expect, knowing that, that they don't have to be the, the raging bull on cross-examination and response, I think will go a long way. And you'll have a judge looking at the witness and, and, and give them some credibility. Because that's really what we want. If we're putting someone up, they got to be credible or we just, it, it, it's for naught. Um, Leading is objectionable, we all know that. Um, let your witness shine. Again, that's, that's, you know, every jurisdiction is different, but on direct examination, you want to stand back. You're not the star. Your witness is. Your witness is giving the testimony. <laughs> Follow-up questions. You said you saw this, Ms. Jones. Can you tell me what, you, can you describe a little bit further what you saw? Can you tell me, uh, you know, where you were? Can you, can you <laughs> describe what that, that, that room was like? Can you tell me where, you know, my client was, the, I said my client, don't say your client. Your client's not your client. Your client is a person. She's, a, she's Miss Smith. She's, use their names. That, we're talking about humanizing, <laughs> never use my client. It, they are a person. So, yes? Um, often in court people will either say Miss Smith or the mother, which, you would, which would you say would be a better tactic for either one? Either, either you know, that, that's a good point. Um, the mother's good. I think um, the father, the dad, um, know your judge. Um, but either one, just not my client. You want to you wanna use them interchangeably. Use them when you're talking. What did you, you know, when you're having a witness describe a visit, what did you see the mother do? You know, what, what did, how did the mother act? I think that's, you know, you, you don't have to be locked into one or the other. You know, everything we do is strategic, and, you know, thinking through these things and what this looks like in advance is, is pretty important. So that, that's a good point. And uh, that's a culture thing, too. If you're in civil or criminal court, you're not going to refer to her as the mother, right? That's just something we kind of get away with in dependency, but it is humanizing. So don't be afraid of it, but just so you know, that's a culture, that's a dependency culture thing. Uh, leading questions. Uh, the house was filthy, correct? That is a leading question. It asks her, it suggests a conclu basically tells a conclusion, not on direct. Um, was the house filthy? Yeah, it's a little leading-ish, but depending on your witness, judge may give you some, some, uh, some space. Open-ended question. What was the house like? 
Well, that is a better question for a number of reasons. It's better for evidentiary purposes because it gets you away from any kind of leading objection on direct. And it also, you're going to get that, you're going to get the description. You know, the house smelled horrible, you know, etc. What did you see? What, and so that's a better question. So when you're at your desk and you're drafting these questions, think about questions that are going to elicit testimony and, and descriptions out of your witness. And, you know, follow up. We're going we're gonna to talk about this a bit today. You know, when we first do these trials, it's, it's nerve-wracking. It's, it, it's tough. And what we forget sometimes is we get locked into our, our sheet of paper, and we'll talk about notes in a little bit, and we're not listening to the answers. And you've got to listen to the answers. I have had more trials where um, the, the witness is throwing me something that's just absolutely fabulous. Um, a witness has thrown me an answer that all of a sudden became my theme or a big point in my, cross, or in my closing argument. So if you're not listening, you're not picking up on it. You, you, you'll get your questions, but listen to your witness. And depending on their answer, you know, that it smelled horrible. That's a good, good answer. How did it smell? How bad did it smell? What was that like? How did that make you feel when you came into the room? Get that description. Now you're, you're putting the judge into that place and, and, and you can, you're giving those words out. You're creating mental Im images. So don't forget, once you get your answer, can you describe that a little further if they haven't given enough description? What was that like? How did that make you feel? You know, those types of questions, and then that will bring out, the, bring out the witness in the testimony. Uh, direct examination, who, what, where, when, why, how. Just like I was saying, those are the types of words and the types of questions that will bring out the testimony. If you're getting yes or no answers out of your witness on direct examination, you're not getting the, the full benefit of, of why you want. Ma'am, can you please explain, you know, why, you know, what you saw? Can you can you please describe further? You know, that that's not an ask and answer. That's you're asking them to elaborate, and you get to do that. And it's really important. So if you're on a, on an issue, we call them chapters, and we'll talk about it in a little bit. But if you're on an issue, make sure you go the distance with it. You know, further ask those follow up questions. Get them to describe if that's where you're going with your witness. Um, one fact sequence, use plain language. You know, when we, we get out of law school and we know very little about really doing trials. And we, we, we're trained, we spend a lot of time in law school and we talk a lot about little legalese. We go to the lunchroom with our colleagues and we're talking about two sixes and three eighty eights and, and um, you know, things like that. And, and um, remember, you, you know, dependency, you, you can do that because your judge is there. Juries is completely different as far as them knowing some of the lingo. But I would, um, your witness may not know that. They're not going to know a lot of that lingo. So make sure you're using words that are everyday language. Not, not I don't want to say too complex, but something they can follow along with. You want a conversation. So just kind of check yourself on, on the legalese. Make it use plain language. And uh, because you don't want your, your witness kind of twisting his head, not knowing what you're saying. Super important. Um, if you you know you put on a witness, you may have five things you want out of that witness. It is very helpful, judge or jury, that you let the judge and the jury um, know where you're going. Head notes, signposting, transitions. You know, if you've got five areas you want them to to testify about. Once you finish one area. Let the judge know where you're going. Now, ma'am, I want to focus your, your attention on uh, the visit on November 3rd. Uh, you know, and it, that, that kind of, it's not so much as a question, but I've never drawn an objection for, for signposting, head notes, transition. In fact, the judge appreciates it because now they know we're, we're done with subject A, now we're moving on to subject B. Um, it keeps things going. Just putting up the witness and just throwing questions at them you know, over and over and seeing what hits and you know, sticks on the wall and making sure, you know, you've covered, every, covered everything but stop them in a coherent, coherent logical fashion. Um, judges get a little irritated. They get a little tired. So especially if you've got a witness on for quite a while, you want to make sure that you are, you're, you're doing those signposting. It helps your witness, too. Now they know they're done with November 3rd. They're going on to know with their observations on November 6th. They're, you know, they're focusing on different things. So really important, and it gives um, 
when I'm in trial or giving lectures, I have a tendency to, to talk too fast. So I have to slow myself down. And that's one of the ways to, to slow down. Silence in a courtroom is a wonderful thing. I was absolutely terrified of silence when I first started out. Um, you know, I had to fill, fill up every word because if I didn't, then people would be looking at me, judges would be looking at me. They may not think where I'm going, they know where I'm, what I'm doing or going. Wrong. <clears throat> give your witness, give your judge, give your jury some time to breathe. And transitions are a great way to do that. And silence can be very, it can be dramatic, but it also will give your witness time to, to catch up and kind of, kind of, uh, internalize and digest that area that you that you um, just covered. Again, you don't want to sit down and you know watch the clock for 10 minutes tick away. But just a little brief pause to, to let everyone catch up and knowing you're going on to a um, another subject. Um, here's the transitions. Let's talk about the two se 2007 fire for a moment. Um, again, gets everyone pointed in the direct the right direction. They know you're on to a different point and moving on. Okay, loops are a great way to um, incorporate words and in, in, um, descriptive words into a trial. You know, if someone says, you know, I, I passed by the fire, it was really hot. Okay, what was it like to go by that fire that was really hot? How hot was that fire? You know, if that's an issue in your case, and that's the description, you know, if, if the if the um, your client in a in a bar fight, you know, issue with the, he gets thrown out of a bar by a by a um, by a bouncer. Um, you know, he wasn't just sent out of the bar. No, he was grabbed and thrown. And if that's a description of another witness or the witness gives you that, how looping he was thrown out of the bar. How hard was he thrown? After he was thrown. Where did he fall? What did you see as he was being thrown? You know, now all of a sudden, this guy wasn't just asked to leave or ushered out. This guy was thrown, 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 and th and that's you know hard. You know, and that's what using those descriptive words and incorporating them. So your your judge or your jury is gonna when they think about your client being thrown out of the bar, they're gonna think of not him being escorted, but thrown, you know, tossed. You know, those descriptive words, and so incorporating those descriptive words back and using that language over and over in your questions really drives the um, really drives the point home. Lay witness direct examination. Okay. Um, what you want to do here is you want to basically let your the judge know kind of why your witness is being called. What are they what how are they relevant to this trial? What kind of information is this witness going to, to give to, to your judge? You know, you're not, don't want to feel like the judge, you're wasting the judge's time. They hear these cases over and over and over. So you're going to set this scene, you're going to describe the action, you're going to describe what happened. So you start out with that, letting the judge know why this witness is called and why their testimony is relevant to your theme in the case. If the witness isn't testifying to your, the witness you called to your theme in the case, are they really necessary? So you really want to kind of check that when you decide whether to put a witness on or not. Um, techniques, exhibits can be great. Um, we use exhibits a lot in, in trial. Um, words and, and stories have words and pictures. Um, so if you have it in a situation where you can use exhibits, use them. You know. That's, that's something tangible that, that your judge can look at. Um, sequencing, you need to think about um, a couple of things. You need to decide how your direct examination, how you're going to sequence it. What are you going to start with? What are you going to end with? You know, a lot of times any bad, or sometimes our witnesses aren't, don't always deliver just 100% great testimony. There may be something in there that, that isn't so great for us. If we want to cover that, so we it, we don't it's not coming out for the first time on cross. I have a question back. Having to do with sequence of uh, testimony, uh, I happen to have a bench officer who likes to jump right in there and start asking questions herself. Uh, what are the rules for that? Because sometimes the judge will say, "Oh, I don't need to ask any questions about that." Um, would you say I need to move back to my theme, or is that what the judge is interested in? So I should go into that topic. Good question. You know, every case is is different. 
every judge is different. Um, if your judge is focusing on something and that's an issue for them, you know, trials are, are changing. You know, it always doesn't follow the script that, that you may think it does. And if you have a judge who has a tendency to, to jump in there, you might want to follow up on something that's in their mind. You know, don't be afraid to go off script if necessary. Um, if your witness throws you something that you didn't, you didn't know was coming that's beneficial to your case, um, just because it's not in your sequence and it's, it goes off your planning, that's not something that you want to just brush over. That's something that you want to take the ball and run with. And that's part of the listening to your witness, not being too concerned about your next question. And it, it's hard to do at first, but, but you can. And just step back and listen to that witness. So to answer your question, you know, if you have a judge who, who really kind of, you know, get me to the point of this witness, why are we here, they're asking questions, I, I think that probably would stay on that theme and ask some follow-up questions and then go back into your sequence. So, you know, you'll know depending on your judge, but don't answer your question in a long way. Don't be afraid to go off script if necessary and it's beneficial to your case. Um, you want to decide not only if you have numerous witnesses, who do you want to put on first? Who do you want to put on last? Just something to consider. Every case is different. No case is going to be the same. So give that some thought when you're uh, when you're going to be calling number of witnesses. Yes. Suggestions? Or do you have suggestions if a judge basically wants to hear witnesses out of the order that you're presenting? Well, you guys are making me go back on my <laughs> promise that this is your courtroom. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, you know, I mean, dependency is tough. You have the same judge all the time. Um, I always wanted to fight my battles carefully in dependency court. You know, in, in, in San Diego, when we get sent out for criminal trials, there's 60 plus judges we may get sent to. So, you know, I had trials in front of most of them, but it, sometimes it's been years in between. Um, in dependencies, same same judge all the time. So. Yeah, you, you want to fight your battles carefully. You you want to, um, you know, if, if your judge, you know, a lot of times, I remember in depend dependency cases, they would call witnesses out of order. It's not necessarily my preference, because you, you do have a sequence and a theme. But if if it's you have to, you have to, you have to be fluid and be able to, to swing with that. So, you know, it may not be your preference, but if that's what your judge wants to do, then I'd be careful about Bucking that that suggestion, yes. But shouldn't we draw the line when the judge is asking us to put up our defense before the department is put on their case? Yes. The, the answer is yes. You know, it, did you have something? No, no. We're just okay. getting close to the break. Okay. <laughs> uh, yes. I mean, you know, it, it, it's your case, and you know, in, in criminal court, you know, the burden. Um, is, is on the, the district attorney, and I, you know, I don't have to call any witnesses. Dependency court, the burden's on the the, um, the preponderance is still on county council, and you don't have to call any witnesses. You don't even have to ask a question. And I forget the number in the WIC. There's a directed verdict. What does anybody remember? The, the 350. The 350. 350. Yeah. So you can say you're taking away my 350 motion, Your Honor. I mean, what are you doing to me? <laughs> yeah, I, I totally agree. I've won a couple of dependency cases on directed verdicts. And if you're already putting on a defense, um, you know, you, you, your defense is, is gauged a lot on, on what the county council put on in their case in chief. So I'd be real, I'd certainly make your record. I mean, if your judge makes you do what you don't want to do, the judge makes you do what you don't want to do. But you've made your record, you've made your objections, and you know the judge may agree with you. Because you're right, directed verdicts are or something, they haven't proven up their case, I mean, let's shut this thing down now. So I would, yes, I would make a record, I would make an objection, and I'd make a request, Your Honor, the county council hasn't even finished their case in chief. Um, so yes, absolutely. Um, sequence, I'll start moving along, I think everyone's ready for a break. So think about how you want to sequence not only your witnesses, but also your, um, your uh, direct examination. Um, privacy and recency, super important, 
really, really important. You know, I like to, to get my witness up there and hit them, get them out there and, and really kind of say what they need to say right up front. Why this testimony is important. You don't want to lose the judge and, and finally get to the point 15, 20 minutes down the road. You know, the judge is going to remember, just like juries, what they hear first and what they hear last. So I like to go pretty, pretty quick and you can always go back for more descriptions, but get that out right out in front. Uh, you want to have a sit-down question. Trials are dramatic, especially in front of juries, but judges as well. You want to have a really good question, and, and you, it's one of those things where you just lean over, Mr. Jones, can you, you know, that final sit-down question, and it's, it's really important in direct and in closing. You want to make that last statement that brings with them, again, using that silence as you go back and sit here in your chair and you've got out what's important. Was there a question back there? Yeah, this is, um, I'm sorry, this kind of goes back to humanizing the client, but also with techniques. Did you find it beneficial in your experience? I tend to, um, when I'm direct examining my client, I tend to always try to get out the fact that they are also a product of the dependency system or if they're like, um, yeah, if they were a foster care kid themselves or um, if they're extremely young when they had kids. Did you find that in your experience to be beneficial or more harmful because then the judge could see them as more screwed up than what the report actually said? Um, that's a good question. And it, you know, so much of this depends. Yeah. What's good for your case? What Does it tie into your theme? Does it help? your evidence go forward. Does it help the testimony? If it's beneficial towards your testimony, absolutely. Um, if it's something where it's gonna, they're going to take a credibility hit, what's the point? I never ask a question during a trial unless I have gone through it a couple times and decided, is this putting forth my theme? And if, if, if drawing that out, is gonna, your, client, your witness is going to take a credibility hit, hit the answer is no. If it's going to humanize them more and it's going to it's going to make their testimony more credible, yes. Case by case analysis. Um, okay. Uh, primacy reason engage with your witness. Uh, consider uh, defense direct. I think we covered that. Um, you get to redirect. Don't don't uh, forget to take advantage of that. There may be something. Now redirect is not a going over again of your, your direct testimony from start to finish. It's addressing those points that was hit on cross-examination. Don't save your best material for redirect. Your county counsel, unlikely, they may not ask any questions. Very unlikely. But nevertheless, you want to get out what you want to get out during your direct examination. And for redirect is really addressing those issues that county council made in cross that you kind of want to clean up. Uh, okay, Kevin is going to do the direct exam drill probably after the break, but we, I think we, we can do this in five minutes. Um, qu question. I did have a question. Sure. The sit down question sounded good, but I didn't quite understand what it was. Sure. Your sit down question is, is basically your last question to your witness, and it's something that's really going to resonate with your judge or your jury. Um, you know, I just did last summer, I did a sexually violent predator trial. And what it is, is my client has served his time, but in, in California, they can keep them basically indefinitely, um, not incarcerated, but sent to a, a California mental institution for forever. And uh, the issue was whether my client was, had a mental disorder that predisposed him to molesting children and was a highly likely to do that in the future. So my, I put on an expert and my last, you know, we walked through, my expert was on for about a day, but at the end of this, you know, my, my sit down question is we walked through her credentials, through, you know, her opinions, her analysis, how she got their client interview, her review of the other, the state's experts, the DA's experts material. My sit down question, my sit down question was basically Dr. Sabrina Bonson, Dr. Slowing it down. You want to be a little dramatic. Is there any question in your mind, after your analysis and based on your training and experience in your interviews with Mr. C, is there any doubt in your mind, question in your mind, that my client is, does not meet the criteria of a sexually violent predator? Any? No. Thank you. 
no questions. No further questions. You know, summing that whole thing up, why is this witness up here? That sit down question, and really just kind of you know, nailing it down so, so the, the judge remembers not about the, the, what questions he, he asked. And you're going to get all that in the middle, but that sit down question, you know, you're, you're going to bring this thing to a close and you're driving this testimony home. So that's an example of a kind of a sit down question. All right, we're going to do the clothing drill right now. This is a direct exam drill. You need a partner. High five your partner. Generally the person next to you. Go ahead. High five your partner. This is super easy, right? Here's what I want you to do. Folks, I want you to cross-examine your partner on what they're wearing. Okay? Now if your partner is like, I got Bill Gates up here holding a pineapple. Ask him about his banana shirt. I want you to use the six honest words, who, what, why, when, where, and how. I want you to ask them to please explain or please describe sparingly. No leading questions. I want you to signpost or head no. And I want you to use loopbacks. I'm not hiding the ball. I will give you an example. This is super easy. But it's repetition that's going to make you guys good at this. Jim, what are you wearing today? I'm wearing a uh, blue shirt and a, a greenish type suit. Oh, beige. You say you're wearing a greenish type suit. Where did you get that suit? Uh, my wife bought it for me. Why did your wife buy it for you? Because she says I don't know how to dress myself. <laughs> and how does that make you feel? I don't have to answer that. Okay. That's what I want you to do. No leading questions. All right? We're going to walk around and listen. Go. <laughs> Questions on direct. Any last minute questions? Yes. Um, I was wondering if you had any advice for when your client decides to testify against your advice. Seven. No, I mean, Seven. look, your client has a right, right? And actually, there's there's weird case law that dependency is not quite criminal, um, but you know, you're there to represent your client. You're not his GAL or her GAL, so if they insist on testifying and it's going to sink their case. Say, hey, it's going to sink your case. I think. 
I'll do my best to protect you, but I think you're going to get hammered. Go do your job, right? Can you elaborate a little more on the prep, don't coach line? The main thing is you can't tell them what to say. You can say, I'm going to ask you this. What are you going to say? And then they tell you and you go, you could point out and go, that's not what you told the social worker. <laughs> right? But you can't say, no, dude, say this. That's unethical, right? Um, it, and, and like Jim said, that's a fine line. You know, and that's one of those feely lines. Like, you're going to know this, this don't feel right, <laughs> right? Hopefully, uh, if you're crossing that line. So you can, you can tell me, these are the things I'm going to ask you. Um, and if they've given numerous statements to the social worker, I provide them with those statements. Look at detention <coughs> report, page three. Now, maybe he says, I didn't say that to the social worker. You go, okay, I'm going to ask you about that, right? And let him explain. That's not exactly what I said. She's twisting my shit, right? <laughs> uh, that's great. But you can't tell him, this is how I want you to say that, or, you know, right? So you prepare him um, or her, and uh, without, without telling them what you want them to say. And like Jim said, always tell, especially if it's not your client, always tell them the first thing, look, tell the truth, right? Because they're going to get asked that. If you're putting a witness on that's not your client, a lay witness, I ask, right? So it's uh, one more, and then we're going to go to break. Uh, if your bench officer has a tendency to jump in and start asking questions yeah. on their own, is there, I mean, do you have any advice on how to handle that other than, you know, No, you just got to roll with it. I mean, you know, uh, I had a judge who did the same thing, and it's just like, you know, um, it depends. If you have a really good relationship with your judge, maybe when in between cases, uh, you can ask county counsel to go up with you and go, Judge, would you mind waiting till the end? Um, if, right? You gotta know. You know, I was in front of the same lady for like five years. I, I you know, I could say that to her, but um, you know, maybe you can. So, you, it's a judgment call. But if you, if your judge is going to jump in and ask questions, you just got to deal with it and. You know, like Jim said, sometimes that gives you a hint in, into where you should go. Um, I mean, could you imagine if the jury told you halfway through the trial, we really want to know more about this? You'd be like, woohoo! Now I know what to focus on, right? Okay, if it's important enough for the judge to jump in like that, that they <clears throat> can't wait, or they can't even yeah. wait for county counsel or the minor's attorney to have their, their, <clears throat> their questions. Um, it's important. That's what he's, he or she is thinking. That's pr you probably want to spend some time, depending on the kind of answers you got. If you got a great answer from your witness and the judge's uh, questions um, that, uh, that support your theme in, in your case, give it a few minutes of yeah. silence and say, okay, I think we covered that. Let's, let's go on to this. If they did a little bit of damage, maybe you want to clean that up a little bit. Yeah, so. don't, don't be afraid to redirect after the judge asks a question if you need to clean it up. Last one, real quick. No, I you you did it. I, okay. In our in our courthouse, I think you're better off really listening carefully to what the judge is asking and yeah. keeping that in mind the next time you you're direct examining a witness. Oh yeah. And uh, also jump on it because that's what the judge is thinking, and oftentimes it's the judge's way of telling you you're on the wrong track. You're you're going down a track that I don't care about right now, or I've already made up my mind about. Yeah. Focus on this because this is what I want to hear. Right. But also. Um, Grain of salt with that, it's dependency. So, um, you know, don't <laughs> neglect uh, your record for appeal because um, we represent parents. We're good at losing, right? <laughs> and uh, you got to make that record for appeal, right? All right, break time, 15 minutes. Is there a bar in this building? <laughs> Sorry.